Hi, I'm Steve Berry, uh, running for the U.S. Senate. I'm here with Mark Stewart Greenstein, who is also for the U.S. Senate in two, uh, 2024. And uh, he's going to be answering a couple of questions that we have uh, that have been submitted by our large audience out in uh, TV land. And the first one is on health insurance. So, Mark, would you uh, help to uh, uh, indicate to us what your feelings are on health insurance? It deserves a reset that makes it closer to the free market. I'm a free market fan. You know that from other debates that we've had. And I think we're in sync on an awful lot of things, Steve. The free market provides such goodness for almost everything we want. Think about grocery stores, which are largely unregulated. And what do we get? Foods in so many varieties, fresh, at different sizes, different quantities. When a few people seem to demand a new item, poof, it's there within six months. And probably it and five other competitors within a couple years are on your shelves. Why? Because the free market regulates itself so well. The price mechanism, ooh, somebody's making a lot of money by selling carameled chocolates this way. You get more competition for carameled chocolates that way. Maybe a slight variation that they're going to do. Clothing is largely unregulated, and we have so many different styles. I mean, it's hard to find somebody wearing the same shirt as another because there's so many different ones. They look like Matt a lot because he's got the yellow one. But otherwise, aside from the worker brights, you tend to have so many varieties at relatively low prices. Steve, why not do that for healthcare? which arguably is more important than clothing. It's certainly more important than fashionable clothing. And yet, we've taken it upon ourselves to have government that is regulating when it should back off. When eye surgery was fairly new, the cost of eye surgery was like $20,000 per eye. And in 1991, $20,000 was like 40000 Now what's it? About 1990, 1999, with almost no regulation because they are not the same doctors, they're not under the same supervision. Why? Because, once again, safe health care done privately brings costs down. I'm part of a group that sells a private health offering. It's not quite called health insurance. That's the realm of Obamacare. It's called health sharing. And it started with churches um, who, for many decades, would get contributions from their members so that if a disease befell one of them, a bad injury befell another, and he couldn't work and provide for his family for a while, that privately amassed pool was able to cover very well. And guess what? When that person got paid, who's he grateful to? His pastor his fellow congregants. And is he going to do the same thing for somebody down the line? Absolutely. When you have the government instead untethered to individuals and, oh, this is just big insurance company and I write premiums too and they send me lots of paperwork, you don't have that kind of communal activism that really can and should work. Okay. You want a follow-up question? Yeah. So what do you think about the public option? The public, you better describe it, because I've heard it in several ways. The Bernie Sanders way is a monstrosity that we can't afford. I don't think he even realizes just how $10 trillion, how much it, because that's his estimate, his own estimate, $10 trillion over, I think, three years. Okay, our whole federal budget is $12 trillion over those three years. He is looking to spend almost double the money that we spend on all federal services with one, quote, option, when there's very good options anyway. And because very few people can see their taxes doubling and pay for it, the excess that can't be paid for by the lower income, it's not a doubling to the people of middle and higher income. It's going to be like two and a half times just to cover this whimsical health care for all which, again, we could do ourselves. 
Is okay. that what you mean by public option? Well, though? We'll, I think that later on we're going to get into that uh, in terms of our panel. But uh, I, I just was curious because it is a health care issue. It's a major one. So, OK. Uh, the next one is about political divisiveness. <laughs> Um, you have some uh, feelings on political divisiveness? Absolutely. Yeah. Look, the divisiveness that we're seeing, this is no secret, of further left and further right, and with it, antagonism. Okay, I have no issue with somebody holding a far left position and somebody hopefully at the same dinner party holding a far right position because discourse is good. Mm -hmm. But if it comes to not civil discourse, but because of your view, you're called a racist or you're phobic against a group or you're hateful against a group, that's what, especially from the far left, is coming from ordinary discourse. They've come to decide on the far left that speech is violence. You might have heard that. Well, if that were true, that would be a horrible thing that would dampen speech if I was committing violence by saying something that offended you. But anything can offend these people. Indeed, even non-things called microaggressions, which you can't detect, nobody knows what's truly in your head, but when they determine that something is a microaggression and then it's violent, then you could be arrested for that. Get back to the old fashioned way of good civil discourse, even if your views are extreme. Now here is a beautiful way that these views might actually come back together. It's what you're doing and what I'm doing, running for office as independents. Because instead of just two that are clashing, there's a left and a right, and I call it a north and above. A set of candidates who have good ideas that I think a lot of people know. They call themselves independent at a 40% rate here. 40% of Vermont voters are independent. And if you're under 40, it's probably closer to 70% who are independent. A general feeling among most of that 70%, because you and I talk to them, we are socially permissive. We are fiscally strict. Most families are like that permissive and fiscally strict. Government, if it started acting more like real families, real individuals, would probably start behaving better. Hmm. The, the next question I'd have, thank you very much for that. Uh, the next question I'd have would be on sensible immigration. Do you have some particular thoughts on, on that tonight? Yeah. Um, I think we need a six month hiatus for anyone coming to the country whether that's over a physical border, whether that is on planes, boats, on tourist visas that they might be overstaying, student visas that they might be overstaying, work visas that they might not have the true permission to do. I think most of those people deserve to stay long term, ultimately become citizens. But we are rightfully worried about those who don't believe in e pluribus unum, who are coming not for America as an idea, but for taking. Um, a few that might be taking via crime, not that many, but we should protect against that. A known criminal from the outside shouldn't be allowed to stay. A outsider who commits a crime, you have that only one strike, okay? You shouldn't have the same protections as some domestic born and steeped in our culture so that crime really is a wrong to somebody who's grown up here. Some who have just recently immigrated might not think it's wrong when they do wrong an American. So, Steve, I'd like to see that six month hiatus. Let's figure out in that time, what kinds of people do we want? I'll give three suggestions that the kinds of people we want are those who have made an attempt to learn English and have learned basic English anyway, that they have done something good in their own country, that they're a standout. We want to cherry pick the best. They have helped kids. They've helped democracy. They have helped maybe raise a big family. Um, that's a relatively low bar, but pass that bar as well. And finally, don't expect government welfare. Now, if we didn't have government welfare, I'm a libertarian, and I think that's true for all Americans, we do better off with private welfare instead of government welfare. 
If it's not in their expectation, then we have little problem opening the floodgates. Thank you very much, Mark. So um, I um, have heard you talk about community, and I know you're a pastor in southern Vermont. Would you talk more about what you'd like to do for your communities? Well, one of the things that I've been doing is, is trying to restore the 1786 Rupert Meeting House, which is in a beautiful area uh, of southern Vermont. It's right on the New York border, um, right next to, the next town over is called Salem. Um, and and it's, uh, the meaning of it is, you know, Salam, uh, and it's about peace and righteousness. And and the, the community that began there uh, back in the 1760s, um, began to come into the, the, the town. And uh, slowly the settlers gathered, but they also gathered with indigenous people. So the, the person who had a huge impact on that was named Samson Oakham. And, and Samson Oakham was a direct descendant of the Grand Sachem of the Mohicans. And, and he, he was uh, the person who raised the money for the Indian school. And uh, he went to England and raised a huge amount of money and came back. And he was actually, uh, as this has happened many times in history, taken advantage of. Uh, he left his, his family in the care of Eliezer Wheelock, who was a, a congregational pastor, and um, came back and found his family destitute. He had all the money that he had raised for Eliezer Wheelock. And Wheelock left Connecticut and went to New Hampshire and started Dartmouth College, the first school for, for Native Americans in the country. Only not very many Native Americans went there. But Samson Oakham came up through the Hudson area, and then he brought together settlers and indigenous people, and they worshiped together. And the whole area of Rupert, Vermont, um, is, is steeped in toleration and, and, and civility and care. And now we're human beings, so not everything works out great sometimes, but it started out in a beautiful way. And so when the, when the 1786 Rupert Meeting House was built, what happened was that they had to choose seven people, seven at that time men, uh, who had high um, and honored position within the context of the entire town to be the quote unquote pillars of the church. And on those seven pillars, that church was built. And, and the idea behind it was that it would be a place where there would be um, concord, where there would be care, compassion, and charity for all. So we maintain that, that, that um, Oh, you're a Dartmouth grad from 1986. And I had no idea that you had this subject in mind, but no, no, a lot I, of I us in I Vermont and New Hampshire. I didn't have this subject in mind. I just, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a little history because right now the Rupert Meeting House, we're, I'm trying to save meeting houses, and, and, uh, and Rupert is one of them. It is the oldest meeting house in continuous operation in the state of Vermont, and I'm trying to save it. And I have been teaching uh, students who are interested in ministry, who can't afford to leave and go to seminaries. Uh, they have jobs. Uh, they have a life here in Vermont. So I began a class years ago, and I have graduated seven, uh, uh, 11 people from that class. And all of these people are bivocational. They've gone through three-year programs, and they are keeping these meeting houses alive. And see, the sense is that in these meeting houses, uh, you can actually uh, actually have community. It doesn't. It's not just the place where people worship, but it's the place where you have education. You have programs for for children. You have adult programs. In the winter, you can keep your doors open so that the uh, elderly can come in and have some camaraderie. They can have good food, uh, a place to gather. And, and that engenders community. And so the idea that to take and to make sure that our little meeting houses, there are about 340 in the congregational way in the state of Vermont, are kept open. 
and that there are community centers, welcoming centers, places where people can enjoy each other's company, can learn and, and act civilly and care for each other is, I think, one of the goals that I've had in, in my recent years. Um, and uh, so that's, the, all, of those, all of those graduates from that program, the pastoral preparation program, and there are other persons who also taught classes uh, other than myself, but those people um, all have churches now and they're keeping these meeting houses open for the communities in southern, in southern Vermont. Oh, it's perfect for town meeting TV that we're on. And, and perfect segue because uh, Eliezer Wheelock was the founder of Dartmouth. I was literally wearing this until I got into this very warm studio and uh, had to uh, disrobe slightly. But see, so he's, not, he's not a hero, though. Uh, it's, it's Oakham that's the hero. Right. He was his first student. He, and he was, and he is a hero. And, and he did do a tremendous amount of good work and, and, and loving charitable work. And he brought people together. And, and uh, so I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a story that has two sides to it. And the indigenous side is really an important side that's gotten overlooked, I think. But in the Rupert uh, uh, community, uh, that 1786 Rupert Meeting House is really important uh, to, to that beautiful agricultural valley and uh, to the history of Vermont and also now our own, our own history. Uh, I, I would just say that the, um, the idea of having meeting houses used as wellness centers uh, is a really good idea for the future. And to have places where people can actually join together as they used to do and, and in a civil way, in a caring way, and, and, and establishing and continuing their friendships, I think is really important. You talked earlier about divisiveness, and I think that part of our problem in America is that it's an abstract. Um, people hate each other in an abstract way. But I know a lot of people that are actually uh, can be uh, very far on, on one side of the political spectrum or the other, but they can gather and still be friends and, and still care for each other. Uh, I think that, that that is, you know, what the goal should be. We can have differences of opinion, but we need to be able to be respectful and, and, uh, and still hold strong opinions if we, if we have them. We have about two minutes. I know you're running for state senate. I am. And almost uniquely so, U.S. Senate and state senate, you're on the same ballot in two places for a lot. Yeah. Tell us all what you would like to see done if you're elected to state senate. Well, I have three objectives in terms of the whole, uh, the whole run of, of the senate. And the first is uh, I'm an anti-war candidate. So I think that all of the money that's being plowed into uh, through the military industrial complex into foreign wars needs to go because that $883 billion is, um, is just uh, ruining America. Uh, and, and we've been doing that forever. We have how many uh, hundreds of million dollars that have gone to Ukraine, uh, others has gone to Israel, but we have many, many wars going on all the time and it drains us so that you don't have sufficient amount of money to do things like health care in this country. So I would say, uh, first of all, uh, end the endless wars. Uh, next, to uh, have affordable health care. We have, um, we have, a, we need to have a public option. I can't go into that right now because it'd be too long. But the idea is that, that we have a middleman right now insurance companies and we should not have the insurance companies just be the middlemen because we would have a savings of many billions of dollars. I think $450 billion would be saved if we had a, a, a public option uh, which allows for us to have insurance that would be uh, with a regular insurance carrier, but also um, the government would, would be the one that, that sent the bills or got the bills from the doctors and sent the check to you. The, uh, the, uh, the other thing would be um, with health is regenerative agriculture, uh, uh, supporting our small farms, um, making sure that, that those people who are having farms actually take the food that, that they have that's left and, and that's healthy, good, excellent food and make sure the schools have it, that the hospitals have it, the nursing homes, rather than having processed food go to those people. I think that clean air, clean water, clean soil is a basis for also uh, what we need to have uh, for, for our health. 
we have a, we have a sick care system. We need to have a, a system based on nutrition and on preventive me medicine rather than uh, just lowering pharmaceutical costs. Uh, I believe that that affordability. You can't live on thirteen dollars and sixty seven cents an hour here in Vermont. You have to have at least twenty three dollars an hour, and twenty three dollars an hour would be a livable wage. At least that is what the goal should be to create an egalitarian system. I think that that uh, overall we have some huge problems in our country, but the biggest problem perhaps is in Vermont is our losing our freedoms and, and our losing our sovereignty. Uh, when people censor us, we, we, are, we were supposed to be in a debate with, with uh, two other candidates, a Republican candidate, Gerald Malloy, and the Democratic candidate who, who, is, uh, who calls himself an independent, but he's not an independent, uh, and that's uh, uh, Bernie Sanders. And both of those people have avoided having other voices uh, come in, and we have been censored from the media largely, except here at, at, uh, uh, at this town meeting um, television. And I would just say, town meeting came out of the congregational churches. That's my church. That's we came out of the congregational church because that's our government. The town meeting was held in those meeting houses. That's why they're called meeting houses, not churches. The church was a, was the active group that met there to worship, but the meeting house was a place where they worshiped in. But that's not all they did. They had singing schools there. They had quilting classes there. They did all of this other uh, community organizing right there for the community, for benefiting the community. So Meeting House TV is, is a great name, and that's what we need to do. We need to have strong meeting houses, but part of the strong meeting houses is, is ensuring that people have civil dialogue and that we can have um, uh, a voice and not be censored and that our sovereignty doesn't go away and that we still have the ability to say what we want and, and to, to meet together and to have other opinions. And, and I think that that's really essential for the future of our state of Vermont. Why don't you give your website? I know you have other opinions. Let people hear them. Uh, it's uh, uh, votesberry.com. So it's Steve Berry. Uh, at votesberry.com and yeah, take a look and, and see what you what you think. Um, and mine is stewartforliberty.com, S-T-E-W-A-R-T-F-O-R, liberty.com. And for those who are interested in that health sharing aspect, please look at Impact Health Sharing. It's a very good system. You can see that through my website as well. It saves money. It gives you a lot more choices and it avoids those insurance companies that Steve was talking about. Hey, thank you all for listening here at Town Meeting TV for having us. Steve, for being up here as well. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Take okay, care. yeah.